Stetsonville, Wisconsin. Some of you have been there, huh? A little village, 40 miles uh, from my hometown uh, of Prentice. But I always liked driving through this uh, uh, town as a kid because it reminded me of Dodge City, Kansas and gun smoke. Because Stetsonville had hitching posts and horses pulling black buggies tied to those hitching posts. And I was always fascinated by the folks dressed in black who, who drove those buggies uh, along the highway. They were known as the Amish. And even today, I, I like driving through Amish communities and seeing their well-kept farms <laughs> without any pickup trucks, any tractors, or any electricity. In recent decades, movies like uh, The Witness, uh, television show Aaron's Way, and all sorts of Amish Christian romance novels have given more exposure to this group, and, and yet most people remain puzzled as to why the Amish don't drive cars or use electricity. The reason is the Amish are Christians who believe that by avoiding modern technology, they are obeying the command the Lord gave us in 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, uh, folks, this is a, the second of a two-part sermon on this text, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Uh, I noted that uh, back in 1995, I preached through 1 John, and we spent three weeks on this passage. So I guess you're not quite as worldly as those folks were back then. We're going to do it in two weeks. Uh, last Sunday we talked about what this command means, and we noted that how we uh, may claim to love God, but we still often flirt with the world as materialism, uh, sexual lust, and uh, pride seep into our lives. Today we explore how, as believers in and followers of Jesus, we must seek to live in the world, but not be a part of it. And let's pause and pray that God would use his word to speak in a fresh way to each of us. Thank you, Father, for uh, the Bible, the word of God. And as we continue to think about this topic of what it means to not love the world, uh, I just pray that you'll give us insight and understanding and um, help us to uh, believe and obey uh, what you have told us. Help me to speak clearly this morning. Help my friends to listen intently. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, if you haven't turned there, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. If you use the, the Black Bible, that's page 1021. In the world, but not of the world. <laughs> that, that should indeed be our goal as followers of Jesus Christ. Yet, what does that mean in practical terms? Uh, today, I want to focus on three dimensions of uh, a Christian's relationship to the world and what that should be. Number one, God calls us to be different than the world, different than the world. Christians should be different uh, than those who are not believers in Jesus. The question is, though, how, how are we supposed to be different? Well, well, the Amish think that dressing in plain black clothing and not using modern technology uh, are two ways that uh, we can distinguish ourselves from the world. That kind of makes sense. You know, we, we as Americans spend all sorts of money and energy on our clothes. And uh, uh, that's often a big part of why we do that is our desire to be fashionable. In fact, some of you may have spent a bit of time this morning just deciding, what am I going to wear today? Wouldn't it have been easier just to choose between your black outfit and your other black outfit? That would have done... <laughs> some of you are nodding, yeah. 
In, in fact, you know, in some inner city public schools, students are required to wear uniforms to avoid fashion competition that families can't afford to be a part of. And I suppose we could do that at church too. We would re could require uniforms so that no one would be tempted to dress to impress other people. Now, modern technology, on the other hand, is something which fairly clearly has benefited pretty much everyone, including uh, us as Christians. However, I think the, the Amish correctly point to the fact that materialism, materialism is a trap <laughs> that, that sucks you in. Uh, here's just one example. I would, see if you follow this. Nin 1962, my parents bought our, our first television set. They were out a little before them, but the first one we got was in 1962. That was wonderful, but a few years, few years later, by 1975, it wasn't good enough to have that little black and white television set. So then we got a color TV. 1985, Nancy and I are married. <laughs> well, color television, that's old. We need a VCR. 1994, how can you get just four stations? We need cable. 200 channels. And then 10 years ago, we decided, well, these boxes are ridiculous. You need a big, flat screen television. And now, okay, it has to be high definition. You have to have a DVR, Netflix, on-demand programming of any type you can imagine. What will television be like in 10 years? I have no idea, but, but we'll have to have it. I know that. Because this is all technological progress. But that progress also means we are frequently discontent if, as we're striving to keep up with the, the latest and greatest technologies. And the Amish say, hey, forget all that stuff. You don't need it. Live the simple life. And sometimes I wonder if they might be right. However, I, I have a couple problems with how uh, the Amish choose to be different from the world. First of all, these differences can easily uh, become non-biblical, legalistic rules because nowhere in the Bible are we taught that we should always wear black. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we should avoid using automobiles or electricity or television. And thus, decisions to honor the Lord by avoiding those things, which people may indeed make, those need to be left up to individuals and to uh, individual consciences. Second, keep in mind that it's possible to live in a log cabin out in the woods, somewhere north of Greeny, for example, and not have any modern conveniences and be totally off the grid, and you can still be very worldly. Uh, go, go back to John's definition of worldliness in, in verse 16, 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. You see, folks, if, if I was Amish, I'm sure I could still struggle with sinful cravings like greed and materialism. Because someone can uh, be just as much in love with a new horse and buggy as you can be with a new car. If I was Amish, I'm sure I would still struggle with sexual lust and pride. The Amish make the same mistake that other Christians, some other Christians have made. In the medieval times, men used to become monks and hide themselves away in a monastery thinking that that would make them immune from temptations, but they quickly learn that temptations and sin exist within that environment just like they do within any other. Some of us used to think that we were not worldly as long as we did not drink, smoke, chew, or go with girls who do, or who do, who did, I don't know. Yet there is much more, there's so much more to worldliness than that. It's not, it's not just how we dress. It's, it's not just what we own. Worldliness is primarily about attitudes. And more than anything, worldliness means letting something else in life be a higher priority 
than Jesus Christ. Friends, that's really how we need to be different from the world, (laughs) different from those who are not believers. They are perfectly content going through life not thinking about Jesus. They're perfectly content ignoring the claims he made and the commands he gave. We, however, are to be different. We must not ignore the lordship of Jesus Christ. We are to seek to honor him with our minds, hearts, and lips in every aspect of life. So so, so how do we tell the difference between those who are Christians and those who are not? I don't think it's about how we dress or what kind of car we drive or what we eat or or don't eat or for what football team we cheer or or what activity we do or, or don't do. We can tell who the Christians are because they're the ones who love Jesus. They're the ones who seek to trust and obey and and honor him each day. Remember, it's, it's over 20 years ago, I remember saying, and I've said that, repeated this, you know, I don't want Chisholm Baptist Church to be known as the church where people don't drink alcohol. I, I want it to be known as the church where people love Jesus. And folks, by the, by the grace of God, though, though I haven't had a drop of alcohol the past 20 years, by the grace of God, I think more and more we are known as the church where people really love Jesus. And that's so important. Friends, when others see that there is nothing or no one whom we love as much as we love the Lord Jesus Christ, then we know we are different from the world. Different from the world, but that's not enough. It's not enough to be different. God also calls us to be dedicated to the world. God calls us to love the people with whom we share this planet, especially love the sister-in-law or next-door neighbor or boss or someone else with whom we're having a tough time getting along. We are to dedicate ourselves to bringing the world the great news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's Paul's point in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 19 and 20. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God making, is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, be reconciled to God. Friends, it's true. God so loved the world. <laughs> He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten, his his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And we are to love the world so much that we share with them the message of God's grace through Jesus to all who believe. Here, however, a tension arises. Sometimes we as Christians are so different from the world, so separate that the world pays no attention to us. It has no interest in listening when we proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. Some of you have had that happen. You you try to tell someone at school or or work about what it means to be a genuine Christian, and they just don't want to hear it. Forty years ago, Paul Little uh, of InterVarsity said, the problem for the church The problem for the church is not that we have lost our message, but that we have lost our audience. Now, today some churches and and Christians seem to have lost their message as well, but, but I'm talking about those of us who remain faithful to the biblical gospel. We haven't lost our message. We may not always be communicating clearly and as wisely as we should, but there's nothing wrong with our message. Our problem is that we often preach to the choir, not the folks that sit back here sometimes, but uh, we're, we're, we're talking to people who already agree with us and believe. And, and when the glories of God's grace in Jesus are proclaimed in this room on Sunday mornings, there are often very few, if any, 
unbelievers in our midst. In the New Testament, evangelism, telling, telling other people uh, about the great news of Jesus, involve Christians taking this message to the world. Rather than waiting for the world to come to the church, they went to the world. And this requires that we as Christians relate to the world, to the people of the world, even as we strive to be different from them. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. When I wrote to you before, I, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I wasn't talking about unbelievers. Because, friends, the Bible gives instructions about church discipline uh, will sometimes require that we not associate with folks within the church who refuse to repent of immorality. And yet here Paul tells us to not try to avoid contact with, with non-Christians is foolish. Even if we find what they're doing or saying repulsive, it would be foolish to try to avoid contact with people like that. Jesus didn't avoid contact with sinners. Whether they were drunks or prostitutes or arrogant religious people, they were all sinners with whom Jesus spent time. And if we're going to obey the Great Commission and tell other people the great news about Jesus, we need to have relationships with folks who are not believers, <laughs> with people who are what we would probably call worldly people. And let me... Let me ask you this question. Are most of your friends inside the church or, or outside the church? Most of your friends, are they people inside the church or people outside? My guess is that for, for at least some folks here, the answer is, well, most, most of my friends are part of this church. And some of you may not have any close friends who are not believers in Jesus. I might be thinking, well, Pastor Dan, isn't that, isn't that good? Isn't it a good thing to have Christian friends? Of course it's good to have Christian friends. It's important to have Christian friends. In fact, I think your best friends should be fellow believers in Jesus. And if we're dedicated to loving the people of this world, we need to have non-Christian friends as well. A few years ago, a study was done which found that on a typical Sunday, about 16% of the people in St. Louis County went to church. Not 60%, but 16%. That translates to about 32% of the population, less than a third, who attend church regularly, meaning at least twice a month. You can double that. About 32% attend church with some regularity. Interesting, in, in the Twin Cities, in the metro area, that figure is, is higher, 45%. We're a less church area than the Twin Cities. So the question for us is this. How do we communicate with all those people, the 68% around us, who don't go to church? How, how do we let them know about God's grace in Jesus Christ? How, how do we get them to listen to us? Well, we, we need to develop relationships with these folks. You know, especially today, with, with all the different voices out there, more and more people are unwilling to listen to anyone with whom they have not built some type of trust relationship. Unless, you have, unless they have a, some type of trust relationship, they're not willing to listen to anybody except someone they trust. So how do we get them to trust us? <laughs> well, we build relationships, friendships. Now, you, you don't try to make friends by joining them in immoral activities. You know, going out and getting drunk or high with somebody, that's, that's not the way to get people to listen to us. But, 
we do need to be looking for common ground. We need to identify interests with both Christians and non-Christians share. Back in the first century, that's what the Apostle Paul did. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians 9.20 where he says, To the Jew, uh, I became like a Jewish person. And to the Greeks, I become like a Greek person so that I can build relationships with these people and tell them about Jesus Christ. At school and at work, we should not always be eating lunch with Christian friends. We should also eat with those who are not believers. Rather than always inviting friends from church over for Friday night dessert, we need to sometimes invite neighbors who don't go to church to come to our homes. It's good to be involved in organizations and activities that include both Christians and non-Christians. We need to be uh, we need to avoid being part of a holy huddle. You know, in football, the team. Oh, speaking of football, what a wonderful team there. Um, <laughs> Usually, uh, the team, they, they go in the huddle, they, you know, they, they make the plan, they, they get kind of fired up, they line up, they run the play. Some Christians, however, seem to spend all their time in the huddle. They spend all their time encouraging each other. They even talk with each other about how they need to do evangelism. But they never leave the huddle. They never go out in the world and tell people about Jesus. Friends, huddles are important in football, but, but no team will ever win a game if they never leave the huddle. And the church will never be a faithful witness of Jesus Christ if we spend all of our time talking to each other. Jesus says, we are the salt of the earth, Matthew 5, 13. We are the salt of the earth. And folks, it's time, as, as Becky Pippert said in her book, it's time to get out of the salt shaker and into the world. And that's how, the, that's how the Lord calls us to be devoted to the world. Different from the world, devoted from the world. You won't believe this. This is three Ds. I hate alliteration, but uh, three Ds this morning. Thirdly, God calls us to be dangerous to the world. Different, devoted, and dangerous. When the church and world meet, the world should never be the same. That's what happened in the first century. According to Acts 17.6, the charge against Christians was the, that they had turned the world upside down. Or the New Living says they've caused trouble all over the world. That charge was correct. And, and when I say we must be dedicated to the world, that we must befriend and, and love those who are, are not believers in Christ, I don't mean that we just need to be nice to them. It's not enough to, to sit down and have coffee or go to the, a movie with someone. We need to, to love people the way God loves them. And, and I like that saying, God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. And when we see someone is going along in life, but is ignoring God and refuses to trust in Jesus Christ, we need to say... <laughs> Hey, I love you too much to let you keep going this way. You know, we live in a world where, where Christ is not honored in our political structures, our educational structures, even in many of our religious structures. That means we need to say, hey, this has got to change. I'm too dedicated to the world to let it stay this way. And so, folks, it's important for us to get out of the huddle and not just sit on the sideline, but, but, but to stand up and, and run the play and, and challenge the world. And we need to be asking people, we need to be asking, how do you respond to the crucified and risen Lord, Jesus Christ? Now, how exactly we go about doing that is going to be as different as there are people in this room. We're each going to again, deal with this assignment in a little different way. But each of us needs to stand up for the Lord Jesus in the places and in the opportunities God has given to us. Some of this work is going to be done when you're all by yourself, when you're in your bedroom. And you're praying. You're praying for people you know who do not know Jesus. 
That may be the most potent weapon we have in challenging the world. Some of us challenge the world inside our homes as we raise our children and train them to be people who love the Lord Jesus and who know what is right and who know it's important to do what's right. Some will challenge the world in the classroom, either as a teacher or a student standing up for what's true and, and right and good. Some of us will challenge the world through our displays of honesty and compassion, refuting their claim that Christians aren't really any different than anyone else. We need to challenge the world. And when we do, we'll encounter opposition because the world will find us dangerous. Why? Why would they find this dangerous? Well, because when Jesus Christ is honored as Savior and Lord as he ought to be, the evil structures of this world will begin to crumble. And so, friends, each of us has an important choice to make. Will we relate to the world the way God desires? And I remind you, if you choose not to do that, you're on a dead-end road. The joy and the, uh, the, the meaning for which we all are looking can only be found when we choose to love not the world and everything in it, but we choose to love God. So how can we relate to the world the way God desires? How, how, how do we make sure we're different from, dedicated to, and, and dangerous to the world? First, I, I would simply remind you that we need to make sure we are truly a Christian, a genuine believer in Jesus. It's important to remember that, that, that people who are religious, who have good morals, who believe in God, can still be very worldly. That, that was true for the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They were, they were very moral people. They were zealous in their effort to avoid what they considered worldly behavior. But in reality, they were, according to Jesus, children of the devil. They were worldly just in a different way than the tax collectors and prostitutes were. Because with their lips they professed love for God, but they did not love him in their hearts. They loved themselves. They were proud and boasted about what they had and what they'd done. They rejected Jesus as God's Son and Savior. Friend, the only way one can escape being part of the evil world system is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we turn away from trusting in the things of the world and, and put our confidence in Jesus Christ, we then become a child of God, a Christian. And friend, if, you, if you've never done that, I, I urge you to turn to the Lord Jesus today. If you're not sure whether or not you've done that or, or not sure what that even means, please make sure you talk to me or to Pastor Mark after the service. Secondly, as we noted last week, those of us who are believers in Jesus, who belong to the Lord, should not be flirting with the world. The Bible says we're to be separate from the world. Yes, that includes not doing certain things, avoiding various sinful activities. More important, however, it means developing attitudes and priorities which reflect a love for God rather than a love for the things of this world. Friends, we need to be honest with ourselves because I suspect every single Christian is tempted to be worldly in, in some aspect of life. We all struggle to be consistent with our, our loyalty to the Lord. And so we need to ask God to help us to be truly different from the world in that part of life. Thirdly, we cannot be content with just being different from the world. As we talked about, God expects more from us. We, we're called to be his ambassadors to the world, to a world that does not know and honor him. We're called to bring the great news of Jesus to people whose lives are being ravaged by sin. Friends, I would simply challenge you to identify one way God desires you to share his love through your words and actions with the hurting people in this world. Identify one way that God expects you to share his love with the hurting people of this world. And then, once you've identified what it is that, that you think you're supposed to do, then, by God's grace, do it. 
probably you might want to ask a friend to hold you accountable to, to help you make sure that happens, that you do it. No, we don't have control over how others will respond. But it's up to us to say the words and do the things which reflect the truth and love of Jesus Christ to others. Friends, may the Lord help us to be different from, dedicated to, and dangerous to this world. When we are, we will truly be in the world, but not of this world.